my fellow assassins to another episode of the Dark Assassins Podcast, the show that dives deep into not just technology, but the concepts, software, and procedures behind it all, and explains it so simply that even your grandma can understand it. As always, I'm your host, the Dark Assassin. So now that we are about a week removed from Thanksgiving, I hope everyone has uh, fully recovered from any and all food comas that they might have been under. Uh, I know at least for me, um, we had Thanksgiving leftovers for multiple days after Thanksgiving, which were very good, by the way. Uh, And I'm assuming there are probably many of you out there Uh, who also uh, were in a similar boat to me where you were eating Thanksgiving leftovers for a few days after Thanksgiving and might have uh, gone under sequential uh, food comas due to that. So hopefully uh, everyone's recovered from that by now um, and you can actually, you know, are getting back into the swing of things, getting back into life and all that good stuff. Also, another thing that I'm curious about is last weekend... Um, specifically Friday and, and I guess this week on Monday, um, there was Black Friday and Cyber Monday, which are always known for their great deals that can be had. Uh, now me personally, I didn't really take advantage of any of that. Like, I think I did some like Christmas shopping and found some deals there. Uh, but aside, but if, as far as like home lab type stuff goes, I really didn't do anything, Um, which one thing that is kind of a bummer about that is because the vast majority of everything that I buy for my home lab, like I would say probably in the 95-ish percent mark or so uh, of the stuff that I buy for my home lab is used, used stuff doesn't really get affected by sales like that. I mean, the only, I guess, quote-unquote sale uh, that you can have is when you see, like, the average market price for something going for, like, 150 and then you see a, a you know, a good version and, you know, decent... Con- like, if we're talking about computers, for example, uh, let, let's just go with laptops because laptops are you know, pretty widely sold. Um, so imagine like you're looking at a laptop that usually goes in a good good condition, say for 250 and then you find one that's also in good condition, but it's listed for, I don't know, 175 or something. Like that would be considered a quote unquote sale, I guess, if you will. Uh, but, but then again, it's not really a sale because you have to be actively looking for it and digging through listings and it's a whole thing. Uh, but regardless, all that aside, if any of you got some good deals uh, on Black Friday or Cyber Monday, I would be interested to hear about those. Um, but for me, I didn't, I didn't really get anything. Um, now, before we get into what nerdy stuff I've been up to this week, because I owe you guys uh, some information uh, about that whole backup script stuff that I mentioned last week, uh, in that episode. Uh, before that, I, I want to point out a pretty hilarious email that I got this past week. Um, so supposedly, I this is a listener. I'm putting this in heavy air quotations, by the way. Um, they said, Dear Dark Assassins, Inc. Uh, now, one thing I want to keep uh, point you to, since obviously you can't see this email, is... You know how usually when you're writing a letter or writing an email and you put dear so-and-so, you have a space between dear and the person's name or title or whatever? Yeah, they didn't do that. Um, So that's rather peculiar. Uh, So then they go on to say, I recently discovered your podcast show, The Dark Assassins Podcast, and I'm deeply impressed with your work and the contents you put out. Okay, uh, thanks, I guess, if you are indeed a real person, which I have my doubts, but if you are a real person, thank you. Um, And then they go on to say, I would love to help you create a website for your podcast that is as spectacular as everything else you do. Now, I'm flattered that you think everything else that I do is spectacular, uh, but if you 
would have actually listened to the podcast and gone into like the show notes or did any sort of research about the podcast, you would know that there is already a website for this podcast. Um, if you didn't know that, um, you, well, now you do, I guess. Um, darkassassinsinc.com slash podcast. Uh, if you just go to the website, darkassassinsinc.com, there's a you know, a tab that you can click on for podcast. Uh, I'm pretty sure, especially, I know in Apple Podcasts, I'm pretty sure there's like, you know, literally a link. I, I believe it's on even on every episode that can take you to the episode's website that'll take you right there. So like any kind of investigative work, you know, would have, you know, brought you to the conclusion that a website already exists. So I don't need one. Um, Plus, I also find it a little peculiar that you would ask someone that, you know, does this stuff, you know, like programming, you know, home labbing, all this stuff, uh, if they would need a website made for them. Because that's kind of the stuff that, you know, we do. Uh, now, granted, I don't particularly enjoy web development. Uh, pretty much my expertise in web development consists of finding a template online, a free template online that I like, pulling it down, and then making the necessary changes to it visually to make it my own. Like, you know, changing pictures around, changing what the text says, you know, all that good stuff. And that's about the extent of my web development and what I want to do with it. Because I think, as I've mentioned many times on this podcast, graphics and me don't exactly mix very well. We're not exactly the best of pals. Um, graphics is, and anything with, like, user interfaces is not my forte. Uh, I keep it very bland and very basic. One, because I don't necessarily have the skills to do anything better than that. And also, I'm terrible at coming up with designs like I can look at a design and appreciate it and say yes that's good or no that's not good but coming up with that by myself that that's just kind of goes way over my head uh, but the final nail in the coffin for this email was so as many of you are probably aware uh, if you have your email has like different filters to it, right? Like the biggest one obviously being the spam filter. So if you get an email that is spam and essentially not legit, your email provider will automatically forward it to your spam folder. In a nutshell, that's, you know, how it works. So it didn't go to the spam folder, but it went to the uh, newsletter uh, folder instead. So if it was a legit email, it theoretically would have gone to my inbox rather than this newsletter email uh, folder. So, yeah, definitely, you know, I've gotten a, a few of these kinds of emails from people being like, you know, obviously automated things. But this one I found particularly interesting and thought you guys might also get a kick out of too. So that's why I brought it up. But all of this preamble aside, let's get into how we start every episode, or at least most of them, with what nerdy stuff have I been up to this week? So, in all honesty, when I was trying to th figure out the things that I did this week, I didn't really come up with much, and then I kind of thought about it and was like, eh maybe but in real realistically yeah realistically if i can actually talk um i compared to other weeks i didn't necessarily do a whole lot especially considering the main topic that i wanted to talk about which is um how, how my backup script worked um that i mentioned last week's episode was technically nerdy things that i did last week I'm just talking about it this week because I recorded last week's episode before I actually did said dirty things. So, anyway, the backup script. So, there's good news, and there's a little bit of bad news. The good news is, I have a completely archived file 
of my NAS saved on my XServe. So it worked. The bad news is it didn't go off without a hitch. There were a couple of hiccups that I had to troubleshoot. So I will say, before we kind of get into the problems that came up, it was very nice to, you know, have all that horsepower and processing power and seeing, you know, the CPU usage of my NAS and, you know, the XSERV, you know, rising and the fans spinning up and hearing nothing but absolute silence. It was beautiful. I was able to run my servers at like essentially full tilt, maxing out the CPUs, making the fans roar, and creating an absolute space heater, I'm sure, in my upstairs office, but having to deal with none of the downsides because I was not home at the time, uh, which I guess is one nice thing about the cloud, right? Especially if you have a cloud that's at your house. Um, if you're not at your house, then you don't have to worry about hearing any of the server noise when you're using them. Um, so now getting into the, uh, I guess, hiccups, uh, if you will. So the f first off, the first part of the script uh, went off without a hitch. So the first part of the script is uh, going to my NAS and archiving everything on there and creating a checksum of that. That worked flawlessly. Now, I ran this script, I believe it was around like, I don't know, eight or nine o'clock in the evening, something like that. And then by the time that I actually went to bed that night, which somewhere I think between like 11 and midnight, something like that, um, I, did a, I did a check as I was periodically checking uh, the status of the backup. And I believe, and at that time when I went to bed, it was still archiving the NAS. It was almost done, but it was still archiving it. Or was it doing the checksum? I think it was still archiving. Anyway, um, so it did that, and then it did the checksum. That worked fine. And then I woke up the next morning, and I checked the status of it, and it said it was copying the data to the excerpt and I was like okay uh probably took longer than I expected to do the checksum because by the time I went to bed it was basically almost done archiving the data so I wouldn't think doing the checksum would have taken that long but you know fair enough um so I thought you know let's see what kind of progress we're looking at uh as far as copying it to the excerpt so I log into the excerpt and I navigate to the directory where the file should be, and the directory is empty. And I was like, huh, that's weird. So I checked the script progress again, and it still said it was, try it was copying. And I was like, okay, something is wrong here. Something did not work. So I killed the script, and I was starting the troubleshooting process of what went wrong. Now, when I was originally creating the script, I did the testing and everything worked fine because obviously when you're testing it, everything works fine, right? Um, so it worked fine and I wasn't exactly sure what the issue was. I wasn't sure if like the file was too big because it was over a terabyte um, or, you know, what the issue was. Um, so I was trying to go into the NAS and manually copy it over to the XServe and just try to see what was going on. Um, and when I logged in to the NAS and tried to manually copy it, at first it didn't look like it was going to work because it took it, a, took it a while, took it some thinking, which I guess if you're trying to copy that big of a file, it's going to take a little bit to, you know, <laughs> figure out to, you know, copy the data. Um, but it, it worked. It was starting to copy, and I was like, okay, this is weird. What the heck is going on here? And then I realized 
that when I was testing the script, I was only testing it on directories that my user that I was logging into the NAS as had access to. The problem is there are certain file, certain directories on the NAS that my user doesn't have access to. Specifically, I have, I believe, two users on the NAS, and my user doesn't have access to the other user. So if I would try to archive the NAS, it would get to that directory of the other user and fail because I don't have permissions, you know, to write the data and, you know, archive it. So I figured, all right, I don't feel like dealing with permissions, so I'm just going to run it as root because root user go burr. And root user did go burr. Root user solved the problem because the root user has permission to do anything and everything. Um, so that fixed the problem of archiving it and checksumming it. But here's where the problem came in. The problem was the root user didn't have the SSH keys in order to log in to the Xserv without needing a password. So that's why it was essentially got hung up on the fact that it was trying to copy the data to the Xserv because it was literally just waiting at a password prompt for who knows how many hours waiting for me to enter a password, but because I ran it in an Ansible playbook and in the background, there was no way to enter the password, and yeah. So the reason why I didn't catch this during my testing also was because... This was something I realized after I did all my testing, and I was like, okay, that's okay. Uh, I can just tack on the dash B command uh, when I run the Ansible playbook, uh, which the dash B just means to become or become the root user. It's become the root user by default. Um, and because the root user didn't have the, you know, the, the SSH keys in order to... Uh, automatically log in and authenticate on the Xserv so it can copy the file. That's why it got stuck. Um, so the reason I was using SSH to copy is I was using SCP, which, as I've mentioned before on the podcast, is just copying files over SSH uh, so everything's encrypted, which, I mean, it doesn't really matter because it's all internally on my home network anyway. Um, but it's, in my experience anyway, copying files over SSH is way quicker than doing it over like any other kind of file transfer specifically like SMB uh, which is another which is I believe it's like kind of like the main one used in Windows Samba um, that protocol has some overhead associated to it so it, you don't necessarily get as fast of speeds and obviously I wanted to try to do, do this as fast as possible and I can easily um, from a terminal command, you know, do an SCP with an Ansible playbook, and it would be super simple and super easy, so that's why I did it that way. Um, so, basically, what I ended up having to do was, because I changed, I ended up tacking the dash B flag onto the Ansible playbook that runs the entire playbook as root, so basically what my solution and fix to it was, I guess we'll we'll see, because I didn't run the whole playbook again because I'm not waiting hours and hours to regenerate a new archive of data because ain't nobody got time for that, um, which I guess I did have time for that, and I was away from home, so I wouldn't have had to hear it anyway, but I didn't feel like waiting, um, so I just didn't do it. But my solution was don't tack the dash B flag to become root for the entire playbook, but only tag become root for the specific um, different plays or instructions in the playbook itself um, that need to be root, become root just for that actual uh, play, if you will. Um, so for example, like for archiving the data and doing the checksum, I obviously, obviously need to be root because if so I have permissions to do what I need to do. But then when it comes to transferring the file, I don't need to be root for that so I can just be the regular user. So I don't need to add the become uh, flag to the specific play in the playbook, if that makes sense. Um, so 
what I ended up doing was I just ran the second playbook, which is the playbook that actually handles the copying of the file over to the Xserve and running the checksum on the Xserv and then sending it back. So that one worked without a hitch once I figured out what the problem was, and that was because you know I was trying to be root and authenticating as a root user when the root user didn't have the SSH keys in order to automatically authenticate. So that went off without a hitch, and then I got the checksum back, and then I compared the two checksums, and once you know it, they were the exact same, so the file copied perfectly, and everything was all right, and I have to say, I did a little hooting and hollering, dancing and cheering when I figured out that it finally worked. So hopefully, um, when I go back for Christmas and do some more traveling then, hopefully I can actually, I'll, I'll plan to run the script again, and uh, we'll see if it actually works without a hitch and does everything rather than me having to go in and <laughs> do some modifications and, you know, add some manual effort in there. Hopefully I can just run the script and then a few hours later, however long it takes, everything will be done for me and it'll be all good. But, you know, we'll see uh, what happens. Um, but I will say one thing that was nice about that kind of going back to the fact that, you know, I could have my servers being as loud as they need to be and not actually having to hear anything, um, was I have a Grafana dashboard set up for all of my servers. Uh, so I can actually pull metrics from their IPMI. Um, so if, if you're unfamiliar with what IPMI is, we talked about it in a previous episode. You can go listen to it after this. But basically, uh, because you can pull... Uh, information about system health, like, you know, CPU temperatures, what, how much power is being drawn, fan speed, you know, all that good stuff. You can pull that data from IPMI of the server. Uh, what this allows you to do is allows you to, you know, throw it in like a dashboard so you can visualize the data. Um, so I had it done for both of my Dell servers, but ever since I got my XServe working with IPMI with the Lights Out Management port, um, I wanted to get that put into the dashboard too, but the problem is I don't like hearing the XServe being on because how loud it is uh, unless I actually need it to be on and I didn't feel like turning it on just to, you know, add the stuff into the dashboard, but because I wasn't in the same room or even the same house or even the same zip code as the thing it didn't matter <laughs> and because I can VPN directly into my home lab and have access to my home lab from anywhere which is amazing I was able to set up the dashboard as to my heart's content configure everything the way I wanted it and it worked great um, so if you haven't heard of or used Grafana dashboards before uh, basically, what Grafana is, is it's essentially just like a web UI that you can access and then how it and then it pulls data from a database. So you have to set up your own database for it. Um, there's a couple ones out there. Prometheus is one of them. And then there's another one. I forget what it's called that I also use. Um, but I know Prometheus is one of them, but there's a couple other ones that I believe that you can use. But basically how it works is you store the data in this in these databases, and then Grafana essentially will run queries to those databases to pull the data and then can display it on the web UI's dashboard for you. Um, so that's how you can see all the, the pretty charts and graphs and, you know, whatever you customize it to. Um, so... It's pretty easy to store this data, so I have two main things that I monitor. One is my internet speed, so basically what it'll do is there'll be a, it's running in a Docker container, so cool, cool, cool points there. Uh, so basically what it does is it will do pings and run speed tests with through speedtest.net to pull the metrics of my latency, my ping, um, and my upload and download speed. And then it'll save that to a database, and then the Grafana dashboard can then pull that data from the database and display it in the web UI. And then the other one, which is also running, 
in a Docker container does the exact same thing, except rather than pooling internet metrics, it uh, uses IPMI commands to pool uh, all the IPMI data from both my Dell servers and my XServe. So that is pretty darn cool. And then obviously Grafana can, can pull that into the web UI. Um, so getting that set up was another, another task. Um, and then as far as other things that I actually did this week rather than last week, but I'm now just being able to report on it, um, a couple minor things. So the first one is I kind of optimized my Ansible playbooks, specifically not really my playbooks, but my hosts file. So what for Ansible, how Ansible works is you have a host file which has like, you can define different like groupings, if you will. So you can have, so for example, I have a servers group that has like all of my, you know, virtual machine, all my specifically Linux virtual machines so that I can, you know, manage them and do up push updates and all that kind of stuff. And then I have other groups for each of my hypervisors, the VMs on each one of those. And then I have another group for my Linux development environment, one for my Windows development environment, uh, one for my Mac OS development environment. So you can basically segment, um, you know, different types of hosts or IP addresses or domains or whatever into these different groups. And then for each group, you can set your own variables like a user, um, pseudo password, for example, um, what kind of Python interpreter you want to use, you know, all kinds of different things that you can set. Um, so one thing that I was doing was I was, I, it was very repetitive because for every group, it was always Ansible user equals Ansible, Ansible, interpreter equals you know python 3 uh become password equals password and yes i had the plain text password in the hosts file which i know for shame on me talking about security and all this stuff yet having my plain text passwords in the file for shame I deserve all the shame for that. I wasn't happy about it and I didn't necessarily feel good about it when I did it but I fixed that, and the way that I fixed that is w another thing that's built into Ansible is uh, it's called Ansible Vault, and basically what this is is it allows you to encrypt stuff. So basically what I did was I created a separate YAML file specifically for my passwords so I can encrypt them, and then using another YAML file I can read... The encrypted file so essentially that I have my password safe and secure and everything is good no more plain text passwords so this was kind of annoying to set up because I didn't really understand how to do it and it kind of took some troubleshooting uh, but basically how it how it worked and how I got it to work was in the main directory where my hosts file is, I created a folder called group underscore vars. And then in that folder, any subgroup that I wanted, I would create another folder. So for example, uh, my Windows environment um, is called Win WinENV, right? For Windows environment. So if I wanted to create specific variables for the Windows environment, I could create a folder inside the group underscore vars directory called WinEnV, Win and, e and, and then inside that folder, create two files. One's called vars and one's called vault. Y both YAML files, vault and var. And, or vars, one of the two. Um, and in the var, vars.yaml file, you have every variable that you want, and then even ones that you want to be encrypted. And then basically, if it's encrypted, if the, so for example, like passwords, if you wanted a variable for your password, what you would do is you would have the name of the, what you want the password variable name to be. So for example, um, if we're talking about Windows here, uh, it could be Windows user password, let's say. And then you would do like a colon, and then in quotes, you would do curly brace, curly brace, and then vault underscore, and then what the name of the variable 
password variable in the vault.yaml file is. And then what that allows the hosts file to do, going all the way back to the main directory where the host file is, um, what you can do is you can set so set the thing. So for the password, it'd be like Ansible password is the variable, and then it'd be equal to uh, quote you know curly brace curly brace, um, and then the name of the variable from the vars.yaml file. And then when it goes to the vars.yaml file, it can then pull the encrypted data, decrypt it, and then um, go on your merry way and do it that way. So it was definitely a process um, and kind of not, for at least for me, it wasn't necessarily super straightforward because I, had, I hadn't set up my variables that way before. But now that I've actually set my variables up that way, it it's pretty darn simple. I know kind of me saying it was without any kind of like diagrams to like point you and direct you probably sounded like a bunch of word salad. So I'm sorry about that. Um, but it it definitely makes me feel feel better that <laughs> I don't have my plain text passwords saved in my Ansible hosts file anymore. Um, and then on a similar topic um so one thing that because windows is weird um you can't when you're using ansible you have you can't ssh into a windows machine unless you do some fancy magic work on windows to like enable open ssh or some other ssh server application um, the default way to remotely manage a Windows machine is through WinRM or Windows Remote Management. So one thing that I recently started trying to work on, uh, which is this is a very recent endeavor, is try to make an interactive client for Mac OS and specifically for Mac OS and Linux because I'm pretty sure there's a way to do it on Windows, although this script would also work on Windows too. Uh, basically, an interactive client to, you know, essentially work with the Windows remote management protocol, essentially. Uh, because when you're using Ansible for that, um, you have to download the Python package PyWinRM, I believe it's called. Um, so I already have it installed, so I might as well try to work with it. Now, it is super, super early stages, um, and it would crash like there's no tomorrow. Um, but I think I've only put in, I haven't put much effort into this. It was just kind of like experimenting to see if I could theoretically get it to work. And I have like a, I don't even think you can call it like, proof of concept or minimal viable product at this point uh, <laughs> because it's just that bad and it would crash so hard but it basically I have it currently set up where if you enter in the IP address you, it'll then prompt you for a username password and the password's hidden so you won't ever see the password in plain text unlike my Ansible hosts file that up until about a week ago, well, actually, up until a few days ago, um, uh, did have that. Uh, but anyway, um, then what it'll do is it will connect you to the Windows host, but there's obviously no error checking there, so if it fails, your program's going to crash. Um, and then it will prompt you to enter a command, and then you can enter a command, it'll print the results from that command, maybe, uh, sometimes it crashes, um, and then it just exits. So there's definitely a lot of work that needs to go into it before it's an actually legitimate remote client, but the proof of concept is more or less there um, and kind of-ish working. Um, it's mainly at this point like putting everything in an infinite loop so it you know, will constantly prompt you until you decide to exit. Um, and then obviously doing some basic error checking rather than just assuming uh, that everything is valid because if you've ever developed software to, before, you know, never trust user input. That stuff, just assume that the user input is garbage and then 
go from there because that's how you are more easily able to prevent errors because if you assume that the data is going to be garbage then you're not gonna run into the problem of oh yeah i'm assuming that this data is what i expect and then oh no you have remote code execution and the system's dead so yeah speaking of the system being dead uh going back to um the that whole thing with me backing up and running everything as root um that's actually in case you weren't aware that's not really a good idea it's generally not advised that you run everything as like you know the pseudo user or the administrator or whatever the most privileged account is because like i mentioned root account go burr so if you root account go burr a command that you either mistyped or for whatever reason were in the wrong directory or whatever, uh, your root account go burr might make your system go that meme where the guy's like, I'm straight up not having a good time because <laughs> you may have to reinstall your operating system. Um, but so imagine you're in the main the root of the file system which is the slash directory because everything below that is the file system right if you're the root user and you type in the beautiful glorious command rm-rf and uh, you're in the root of the file system your entire file system is gone. <laughs> so, well, but there, there pro I think I believe there are some checks like on Linux and stuff to prevent um, certain things from being deleted like that, even by the root user. But even still, the stuff that's going to be deleted is going to be so catastrophic. Uh, unless you have a backup of your machine, you're going to need to reinstall. Um, so yeah, if you run things as root, you really got to be careful because the root user can, or even the administrator user on Windows can do everything and anything. So any command you type in, you're not going to be prompted if you want to do it or not. It's just going to run it. So you really got to make sure that the command you're entering is the command you want because that command's going to run regardless, uh, even if... Even if under normal circumstances it would ask you, like, hey, you're about to do such and such, are you sure you want to continue? Root user, it's like, nope, we're just going to go ahead and do it. Boss man said, let's go, so we're going. <laughs> Doesn't matter if the system's going to be destroyed, we're going. Uh, full send, as they say, as their kids say, I guess. Um, so that was a very long catch up of nerdy things that I've been up to this week, which. Now that I think of it, this has pretty much been the entire episode, uh, which, I mean, I don't think necessarily that's a bad thing, um, but it is what it is. Uh, another thing that I've been working on this week um, that I kind of, which isn't really a nerdy thing per se, because I was forced to do it um, because, you know, uh, violation of the Eighth Amendment, um, obviously that's hyperbole, uh, but w w the, so... One thing I guess I want to talk to talk about because I guess it's kind of an interesting concept is this idea of a vehicular cloud. Now, what is a vehicular cloud? So imagine a data center, right? But instead of servers, you have cars on a highway. It's a kind of weird concept, but if you think about it, all cars these days have computers on board. I mean, that's how you get your infotainment systems to work. That's how you can plug your phone in and you get either Android Auto or Apple CarPlay to display on your, you know, console there. That's how you get that, you know, in the center console um, and in, uh, in your gauge cluster. Sometimes there's displays there. There's obviously computers in there, and, I mean, when couple years ago and even i guess even today uh still you know with the whole chip shortage thing it was basically impossible to get a new car and used car prices were going through the roof and the reason why you couldn't get a new car was because of the chip shortage because cars have computers in them so the idea of the vehicular cloud is what if you take these cars on the highway that are driving 
and use their CPU power to, you know, do work, do jobs, post VMs, you know, all that good stuff. And it's it's definitely an interesting concept. Um, in practice, it's pretty freaking terrible. Um, and the reason I know this is because for one of my school projects, I have my cloud computing class or cloud architecture class. Uh, we have to essentially create a simulation where this actually exists. So we are I'm developing a program that'll basically simulate a you know essentially a data center made of vehicles on a highway. And the thing that you have to kind of manage is I have all these virtual machines that have work that need to be done and I need to send the virtual machines off to these cars and while they're driving on the highway they can do work on the VMs and you know do all process you know stuff and complete the tasks and then before they get off the highway they'll then send those VMs back to me essentially migrate them back to me so then if the job's not done I can then migrate that VM off to another vehicle and keep doing that process until uh, the job's done now there are some pretty large drawbacks to this um the the because the well the i guess the biggest thing is the networking problem because if you've ever worked with virtual machines um they're not exactly the lightest especially when compared to containers they're kind of heavy um we're talking generally in the gigabytes which if you've ever tried to download a large file in the gigabytes like a game for example it takes a while <laughs> right and for this project we're assuming um that the the data is transferred through the dedicated short range through dedicated short range communications which is like a type of wireless communication. So we're not dealing with, you know, regular old Wi-Fi or like Ethernet because you can't really do that with moving cars on a highway. You can't really have a Wi-Fi network like that whole thing. Um, but the thing is, is this dedicated short range communication, you know, protocol thing, um, the maximum transfer rate you can have is 27 megabits per second. So if you're trying, and that's the theoretical maximum, mind you. So realistically, you're probably getting less than that. Um, so if you've ever tried to, like we mentioned before, uh, when we were talking about um, uh, the networking infrastructure and the networking hardware, we talked about, you know, networking speeds and comparing downloading GTA 5 on you know 30 megabits per second internet versus 100 megabits per second internet versus the various forms of multi gigabit per second internet and for the 30 megabits per second internet it was i believe around like 12ish hours something like that and GTA 5 was something like 90 some gigs so i mean it's if you're specifically having a VM just for a job that only has one task to complete, realistically, it's probably not going to be that big. Like, I know most of my VMs that I host um, on my hypervisors is generally less than 32 gigs. And, and I, the reason, and it's, the base size of the VM is 32 gigs, but it definitely doesn't occupy all those 32 gigs. Um, it's probably somewhere in the neighborhood of like, I don't know, like 10 to 20 gigs, maybe something like that, depending on what's running. Uh, but I mean, still trying to download that much data with 27 megabit speeds and not only download that data, but then re-upload it. So you're talking, taking the transfer rate, multiplying it by two. So you 
are essentially spending more time migrating these VMs around <laughs> than actually computing and doing the work to complete the task. So it's it's kind of a pain. Uh, try and it's it's I I will say um, I have uh, a, a, the simulation running. And it is quite hilarious to see that, like, it says the, uh, like, the task length, like, projected task length in seconds. So it's, like, it's projected that this task will take, I don't know, 100 and, or 1,800 seconds or, like, 30 minutes. And then you'll see, like, how long it actually took to complete the task between, like, uh, sending it to the vehicle and then sending it back and potentially migrating it around. So it'll be like, you know, it's projected to take like 30 minutes, but in reality, it took a day and a half. <laughs> so, uh, and it was migrated seven times. So yeah, it, it, I mean, if you weren't, if you didn't have the networking problem and the network bottleneck of that 27 megabits per second and you actually had like really snappy fast transfer speeds or even better like you somehow managed to host all of the vm's actual data on like some centralized server like a nas or something um and then all you had to do was like transfer um, basic information about the VM, like, when we talk about, um, you know, when we, like, for Proxmox, for example, one thing that you have the ability to do is migrate VMs around, which essentially is what you're doing here, but what you can also do is you can have those VMs centrally managed on, say, like, a NAS or some other machine, and then what you can do is the actual processing power is done on a different machine so what you can do is you can have your hopefully it's a it's it's you know you have fast storage and a fast internet connection so you don't again aren't bottlenecked by the networking speed but essentially imagine you have like a a nas with all ssds in it so you know you got really fast storage and you got at least a 10 gig link to your hypervisor what you can do is you can host the vm's data on that nas with all the ssds and then have all the processing done for those vms um on the hypervisor itself so you're essentially like booting the drive off the network you're essentially doing a network boot in a sense because the the actual data for the vm is on a different device but the actual work being done through like the compute and all that stuff is done on the hypervisor so if you're able to somehow finagle that and be able to just do the compute on the car itself and not have to worry about the overhead of transferring all that data that the vm has and you just had to say transfer like what's currently in memory to the vehicle potentially that would still take a while um, especially if your vm uses a lot of ram uh, because again we're talking about 27 megabytes per second or megabits per second excuse me um so that's obviously not that fast and if you think like some vms could have like four eight 16 you know who knows however many gigs of ram that's still gonna take a while to transfer but that would be a lot a lot in air quotes quicker than you know having to transfer all that data in addition to say the i don't know 30 like 32 gigs worth of data that the vm actually has you know in its you know file system or whatever um so it's definitely a cool concept um you know being able to have cars on a highway and you're kind of all connected together and uh you can you know compute these tasks and essentially like a mobile data center sort of which is definitely a cool concept heck you know, maybe that's maybe that's the end goal of Tesla, uh, because, you know, Tesla's got I mean, or any self-driving car for that matter, because, I mean, they're sending so much data, you know, back to their back to the cloud and or whoever their host is for like Tesla sending back to their data centers 
um, you know, all their self-driving data to improve the system and all that stuff. Um, so if you were able to, I don't know how fast that transfer speed is, but, you know, maybe as time improves, that could, you know, get faster and better or whatever. Um, but I mean, I think I, I don't remember where I heard this from or if this is even legit. Uh, I think I'm pretty sure it's legit. I just don't remember where I heard it from. Uh, like the goal of like Tesla in a few years, once who knows whenever their self-driving thing is like actually done uh what you can do is you can essentially enroll your car in uber or lyft or you know whatever drive uh you know ride sharing app you prefer uh you essentially enroll your tesla in that and then like when you go to work your car will then go drive around picking people up and taking them places and, you know, can, like, communicate with the rest of the Tesla network or whatever. Um, and it kind of sort of act like a server in that way. Um, so this idea isn't necessarily, like, complete fantasy. Um, but in obviously in this sense of, you know, actually hosting VMs and doing real work is definitely fantasy. Uh, because there are so much... There's just so much overhead uh as we mentioned trying to transfer all that around um but regardless it, it's still you know kind of a cool concept but you know it is what it is um so i think that's gonna do it uh for this episode um if you enjoyed the episode i ask that you leave it a rating and review and subscribe to the dark assassins podcast if you haven't done so already um also share with a friend or family member um who might be interested in you know any of the personal nerdy stuff i did or hearing about a vehicular cloud or you know who knows um also if you have any questions about this episode or you have any topics you want me to cover in future episodes of the dark assassins podcast you can send me an email at contact at dark there's a link for that down in the show notes below and that's going to do it for me in this episode of the dark assassins podcast until next time my fellow assassins remember bull nothing equals true if action not equal to null return true i'll see you next time on the dark assassins podcast